If I can you hear me fine and everything? Oh, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> well, I'm going to uh, begin with a poem that I always used to when my son was very little, like to read kind of superstitiously when I was away from him. And uh, now he's a freshman in college, so I, you know, I thought I had worries back then. I realized I thought I was going to be done with this someday, but <laughs> the, the theme of this poem is still true, apparently, in my life. Um, but anyway, when I first had a baby, I, you know, suddenly the world uh, it was opened up full of products and books and advice and magazines and whole aisles of the grocery store that I had no idea prior to that had even existed. And uh, I learned early that so many of the things that you can buy for your baby, like a pacifier or a stroller or a you know, stuffed animal um, come with the warning attached to them on a label somewhere saying, do not leave baby unattended. And um, many of them then go on to say, no product can replace parental supervision. <laughs> and there, there's just so many of them that you begin to think, there must be a lot of people who do feel that they could buy a product, that there would be a product that would make it possible, you know, you could get a balloon of some sort and then go to Paris for the weekend or something, but you can't. <laughs> so, uh, and that's the manufacturer's warning that the um, title of this poem is, Do Not Leave Baby Unattended. There is a maker who refuses to be sued, a presence among us which does not wish to be believed in, or leaned on, or seen. He drops a small seed in the earth, fruitful, dutiful, blind, and it is me, but the earth around it is also me. He names me this one's mother, and there will never be any other who could share a liability, if anything, if something. The unspeakable lodges itself like a boiling coin of blood on the tongue. Even if I die, this one is mine. My faith is a dove asleep in the slaughterhouse eaves. My attention is a net sewn of smoke and weight. Even if I died, my eyes would have to be always open underground or blinking in the sky. Whoever you are, up all night, embroidering warnings and disclaimers on our things, sleep easy, please. I cannot sue you. I cannot even die. Some nights are darker than trees. The sky in their hair breathes. There is no one in this house when the lights are out, but the great blameless maker and the child and the mother attending these. This poem is a early poem of mine from the same book. And uh, it's uh, just based on a true anecdote. My, my I accidentally inhaled a piece of candy once, and that could have been it for me. <laughs> I was choking. My father hit me on the back, even though you're not supposed to do that, right? You're supposed to give the Heimlich maneuver, but luckily, I spit out the piece of candy, and here I am today. So uh, if he hadn't been there or hadn't noticed, um, where would I be today? So this is called burial. Where my father has retired, there's so much sand he can only grow a small, crooked carrot in the ground. It tastes like a finger, or it tastes like the sound a song makes passing through a rabbit hole. My father has stepped off the porch of his mailman's life into a stinging wind, which pushes the dunes a little farther every year, butter knives them closer to the town, until there's sand every morning on my father's toast, the grainy hello of time on his teeth. When I was a child, I choked one day on a circle of cinnamon candy I'd already sucked to glass beneath my tongue's red scrap. I stopped breathing for a while, and in that place, the breathless wait for death, I heard a train's brakes gouge two melon smiles in the sky. An old woman laughed, then spit in my eye. And though I was only a child, I understood that I would die. I could understand that the whole world was just my breath, and that, without it, the whole world was going to end. Instead, my father came up behind me and slapped me hard and fast on the back. This 
So this poem is called The Cause of All My Suffering. I was so happy when I figured out what it was. <laughs> I don't think it's clear in the poem, though, <laughs> what that is exactly. Uh, there's a line I stole from Baudelaire in this poem, um, but I'm not going to tell you what it is until after the poem, but you'll probably be able to guess because it's the best line in the poem. So it's called The Cause of All My Suffering. My neighbor keeps a box of baby pigs all winter in her kitchen. They are motherless, always sleeping, sleepy creatures of blood and fog. A vapor of them wraps my house in gauze, and the windows mist up with their warm breath, their moist snores. They watch her peel potatoes, boil water from the floor, wearing a steamy gown. She must be like Demeter to them, but like this weather to me, this box of pigs is the cause of all my suffering. The smell of invalids, lotioned, death is over there. When I look towards my neighbor's house, I see trouble looking back at me. Horrible life, horrible town. I start to dream their dreams. I dream my muzzles pressed desperately into the whiskered belly of my dead mother. No milk there. I dream I slumber in a cardboard box in a human kitchen, wishing, while a woman I don't love mushes corn for me in a dish. In every kitchen in the Midwest, there are goddesses and pigs, the sacred contagion of pity, of giving, of loss. You can't escape the soft bellies of your neighbor's calm, the fuzzy lullabies that drift in cloudy piglets across their lawns. I dream my neighbor cuts one of them open and stars fall out and roll across the floor. It frightens me. I pray to God to give me the ability to write better poems than the poems of those whom I despise. But before spring comes, my neighbor's pigs die in her kitchen, one by one, and I catch a glimpse of my own face in the empty collection plate, looking up at me, hungrily, one Sunday, pink and smudged, and ask it, isn't that enough? So the line from uh, Baudelaire is, I pray to God to give me the ability to write better poems than the poems of those whom I despise. <laughs> He must have been a really nice guy, too. <laughs> I think he was being serious. I was being a little ironic. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so now we have the um, substance abuse section of our uh, reading tonight, um, beginning with a poem called Alcoholism. It had nothing to do with how much they drank, how much they drank. The Christmas tree lit like a ladder on fire, the heart like a kerosene lamp. In France, a little dog who could dance the minuet. In Vienna, a deaf man writing symphonies in an attic. Strange things happened in our house the hour after happy hour. Call that one the hour of the tender parent, hour of the big happy plan. Love and tears and bravado and a patience like dust settling on a slab of marble in a cathedral in a small medieval town a town in which our ancestors laughed, passing a flask. That was the flask in which I was conceived, the test tube the world was made in. A blue vapor rose swirling from its throat, a thin veil that became the cosmos. And somewhere, a linear accelerator waiting, an atomic number assigned to every one of us. This homeland, a prologue, this country with no king, except its mercurial soul, its spirit, its tincture. Somewhere, stars, sex, libraries, and that music I'd been waiting all my life to hear. Where was Bach before he reached my ears? Bach in the half-finished basement, Beethoven in the snow at the television's borders. A beggar somewhere found a $10 bill in the street. Oh, Bach was everywhere I didn't listen at the bottom of the fountain, at the center of the mall. All those shiny coins, I could have dipped my hands right in if I hadn't been afraid to get caught. And the forests full of evergreen, moss and pine, and the canned scent of spring. They were perfectly happy for a long, long time. When I close my eyes, I can still see them, wearing the fabric my memory is made of, inexpensive, easy to clean. They were everything to me in their plaid clothes on our plaid couch.
Okay, so this one is called Cigarettes, <laughs> right? Um, and, uh, you know, I can tell that some of you are too young to remember uh, that you could to possibly know that you would have been my age when, you know, you couldn't go out to a restaurant or bar without coming home with your smelling for days like smoke because everybody smoked in bars and restaurants and, um, you know, and uh, that was just the acceptable thing to do, I guess. <laughs> well, my, I grew up with... Um, just surrounded by chain smokers and I actually had a cough for about the first 10 years of my life and I was taken to many many doctors and you know eventually they said that I might have anxiety or something <laughs> so I'm sure I probably did too but nobody thought to say well she's you're smoking around her <laughs> 24 hours a day um, but yeah I can remember I'd be so happy when we'd get on a plane or a bus or something and the smoking section would be because there used to be smoking sections on planes I know you don't believe me you think this is ancient history it was that long ago but sometimes there weren't seats on them so we got to sit in the section that didn't have um but then of course like all bad girls I became a smoker for a little while myself but not anymore but so anyway this is uh not exactly an ode to cigarettes which I think are evil um but this is a uh, I don't know this is a history of them from my life anyway cigarettes Back then, we smoked them. In every family photo, someone's smoking. Such ashes, such sarcasm, the jokes that once made loved ones who are dead now laugh and laugh. Cigarette, hand, cigarette in hand, standing glamorously at the mantel, the fire glowing ahead and behind, and all the little glasses and the snow outside, filling up the bird baths, the open graves, the eyes, and the orchestras in gymnasiums, that mismanagement of sound, the wonderful smoke afterward in parking lots, in lungs, how homeliness was always followed by extravagance back then, like hearing lovemaking in another room or passing suffering on the side of the road without even slowing down. So it is to remember such times and to see them again so vividly in the mind, like a mysterious child traveling toward us on a moonless night, holding a jar containing a light. So I like to look at old photographs, as I'm sure many of you do, and try really hard to imagine what the people really felt like, who they really were in these photographs, and try to believe that they really existed and uh, had thoughts and you know, we're not that different from myself. Um, and it's really hard to do, I think, with black and white photographs, because I don't know about you, but I, you know, think I don't have enough imagination not to believe that those people were in black and white, right? It's very hard for me to see a blue sky and maybe, you know, clashing colors being worn <laughs> on one person when it's black and white. Um, but I, you know, it, it wasn't in black and white. They were just standing around smiling in color just like us. So this is a poem about that. The Sweet By and By. There's a place at the center of the earth where the dim rooms of our ancestors flicker. Their birds are there and their crickets, the warm sand beneath their feet, a picnic, a whale washed up on the beach, breathing in all the air around it, becoming solidity and dreamless sleep. But they had dumb jokes and personal identity, half-baked ideas. I've seen their magazines. They, too, sought pharmaceutical peace, longed for sexual release. It was not black and white, that world, despite the photographs, the amputation saws. There were individual moments, a panoply, the discovery of good luck, the invention of anxiety. But even I, who bring you the news, cannot begin to believe it the lost details of their lives are also lost to me. A white sack filled with black feathers, a hole at the bottom of that sack. Those black feathers drifting into an abyss of similar feathers, never, never to come back. So, a few years ago, uh, 
I went to the gym and, you know, I put my valuables in the locker and then, but I was wearing these ratty old shoes when I changed into my working out shoes. And I put these very ratty old shoes under a bench and when I came back, someone had stolen them, um, which was not only a tremendous inconvenience for me, but also just seemed somehow deeply insulting, mostly because it could only, they could only have been stolen, it seemed to me, to inconvenience me, because why would anybody steal these ratty old shoes? Um, and uh, for a little while, I was pretty sure I knew who it was who'd stolen it, but this might be some um, projection on my part, and I thought it was this really young, fit, beautiful woman who had stolen my shoes. But I would think to myself, <laughs> why, you know, did she try them on before she left with them? I mean, what are the chances that we would have the same shoe size, and why would she want these bad shoes, um, and uh, unless she was just being spiteful and mean. So anyway, for, I went through a little period of time where I, I would see her in the locker room. I mean, I didn't know it was her, but she was there at the same time, and it was late. And so I'd go into the locker room, and I'd, you know, loudly pronounce to all the other women in there and say, be sure to lock up your things because someone's been stealing shoes around here. And I said this many times, and this she actually started going to another gym. I hope it wasn't because of my, I was making her uncomfortable, but <laughs> but anyway, but I she that she either thought I was completely insane or she knew exactly what I was talking about and she, you know, was cringing with shame. So um anyway, I couldn't help but write a poem about that because it was such a such a mystery and I was became so consumed with, you know, self pity and rage and and uh, nothing was ever the same for me at the gym since then. Um, and this is called Stolen Shoes. And it's for the woman who stole my shoes from the locker room at the gym. There's blood within the shoe. The shoe's too small for you. Such is the message in the cleft of the devil's foot. And the shrine piled high with sandals and pumps. And the shameless laughter of the younger women at Starbucks. Leaning back, swinging their legs, full of foam, their cups. So much screaming in a small place, in a cage for a house cat, a cheetah. There's too much room in the shoe, the shoe's too big for you. The fish flopping in a bucket, waddling through the orange grove, a wounded duck. So much screaming in that freedom, butterfly on a windshield, clinging to a breeze. But listen, I too stole something once, only to stuff it in the trash. Together, me and you, Thieves in one another's shoes at last. Or better yet, have we become one another now, running barefoot in the grass? The mystical, final physics of that. I don't think she'll ever see that poem, but if she does, she'll know what it's about. <laughs> so, only she and I know for sure. Um, <clears throat> So this is uh, the, um, uh, the beginning of some depressing bird poems. <laughs> so uh, a, 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 in particular, a couple of depressing aquatic bird <laughs> poems. Um, so this is a horrible story, but I have to tell it to you um, just because everyone should know. Um, there was a pond by our house, and every, every year the swans come and lay their build a nest and lay their eggs uh, in this pond, or not, you know, by this pond. Uh, but it's right, uh, it's kind of on the cor corner of a busy road, and so it's always very nerve wracking to see the baby swans out there and the big swans out there. Um, but they do it every year. And so, you know, a lot of us pass by there and you get really um, attached to these swans because they're there all spring and all summer and you see the babies grow up and you see the parents when they return and, you know, after the winter, you know, however they're related, they might be totally different swans. Um, so anyway, so, you know, the swans are just a really big part of the neighborhood. And um, a couple of summers ago, someone shot a couple of the swans. Um, and it was, I mean, people were enraged and out for blood and um, it was just really upsetting and there's still a big Facebook thing about it and people were, you know, you know, we were really upset by this. It was just so, so horrible, such an awful, pointless act. Um, 
So anyway, and then, pe then people in the neighborhood, and, uh, you know, everybody all around the area started to hear about this and bring stuffed animals and ceramic swans and, you know, balloons. And soon there, were, there was just a huge shrine to these swans on the corner of the road. And one day I was driving by there and there were these bicyclists who were just standing there looking at this shrine. And I pulled up and they, they just, you know, they obviously didn't know. And they said, uh, what happened here? And you could see it was clear they thought, you know, a plane had crashed full of children, <laughs> you know, or a school bus had, you know, I was like, yeah, swans, they shot these swans, and they were like, oh, phew, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's something really, but to us it was very bad. Um, and it was the same summer, so maybe it was four summers ago, uh, when in uh, New York State, uh, a mom coming back from a camping trip with her children and her um, nieces and nephew in her minivan drove she was drunk I guess early in the morning drove the wrong way down the freeway and uh, they were all killed in that so that takes place in this poem as well swan logic swan terror and swan stigmata three of them slaughtered at the edge of the pond and one still one still gliding in wounded circles on the black mirror of that like some music box tragedy inside some girl. Or the swan inside the dying man pacing the hallways with a ball and chain. Feathers in the road, one still, one still trying to drag itself back to that black glass. Incoming, the nurse says, referring to the minivan. We must prepare the tables, we shall wear white. The mother, the mother was drunk, the children were killed, except for one except for one. At the fair, the wild lights, lace your shoes up, little shoes up, little darlings. I'll take you there tonight. There, tonight, the eternity of that. Swan logic, swan history, the white tents on fire, the air raid sirens, the bloodied brides, the grand hotels, the outgoing tides, the slow progress of certain diseases, the urgent warnings, the urgent warnings, the dreamy terror of certain summer mornings. Swan God who, God who, who shot our swans, who was a decent man, who loved his family, who could not bear to watch them suffer, who killed them lovingly one by one. Swan boats, swan souls, swans in cages, in trunks, in boxes, in plastic bags, swans still dragging, swans still circling, swan still, Swan stillness and swan slaughter still circling the center of the swan. So here's another sad bird poem. <clears throat> My husband and I had a big argument about this where he insisted that it's only geese that fly in bees in the sky. So anyway, now every time I see a V of ducks in the sky, I drag him outside <laughs> and I make him look at it. And I'm sure you've seen too, especially this time of year, you know, there'll be this perfect V of ducks, you know, headed south. And a lot of times there's one or two straggling behind and they're, you know, uh, looking sort of sad and I always wonder if they'll catch up or what's wrong with that duck. And so anyway, uh, it seemed to still... At one point I saw this and it seemed to speak to me of the human condition and uh, so I wrote this poem. The Call of the One Duck Flying South. So far behind the others in their neat little V, in their competence of plans and wings, if you didn't listen you would think it was a cry for help or sympathy, friends, friends, but it isn't. Silence of the turtle on its back in the street. Silence of the polar bear pulling its wounded weight onto the ice. Silence of the antelope with a broken leg. Silence of the old dog asking for no further explanation. How was it I believed I was God's favorite creature? I, who carry my feathery skeleton across the sky now, calling out for all of us. I, who am doubt now with a song. Now, in this poem, I have no story behind it at all. It's, I think, um, my favorite poem I ever wrote, and I'm sorry, but no one else ever really seems to like this poem very much. <laughs> but I'm going to read it because <laughs> I, I like it. I, you know, I wrote this poem. I thought, 
there's a good poem. That's the best poem I ever wrote. I sent it out to a billion places. It always came back. And they were like, well, we like your other poems, but not that one. And um, yeah, and then when I was publishing my book, my editor, I knew he was going to say it before he even said it. It was like a premonition or something, but he said, you know, maybe that poem could get cut. <laughs> I said, no, it's the best poem I ever wrote. So anyway, I'm sure you won't under think so, but no, because no one else ever has, but I'm going to read it at the public pool. I could carry my father in my arms. I was a small child. He was a large, strong man, muscled, tan, but he felt like a bearable memory in my arms. The lion covers his tracks with his tail. He goes to the terrible Euphrates and drinks. He is snared there by a little shrub. The hunter hears his cries and hurries for his gun. What of these public waters? Come in, I said to my little son. He stood at the edge, looking down. It was a slowly rolling mirror, a strange blue porcelain sheet, a naked lake, transparent as a need. The public life, the radio songs, political art, the hall of stuff we bought at the mall, the plugged up fountain at the center of the museum of crap that couldn't last has flooded it all. Come in, I said again. In here, you can carry your mother in your arms. I still see his beautiful belly forever, the blonde curls on his perfect head, the whole Botticelli of it crawling on the surface of the water, and his sad, considerate expression. No, he said. So this is a recent um, attempt to do a wonderfully good deed that just left me very, looking very stupid in public. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, this is another uh, younger woman who if she ever does see this poem, which she won't, but if she did, she knows exactly what I'm writing about. Um, and it's called, For the Young Woman I Saw Hit by a Car While Riding Her Bike. I'll tell you up front, she was fine although she left in an ambulance because I called 911. And what else can you do when they've come for you with their sirens and lights and you're young and polite except get into their ambulance and pretend to smile? Thanks, she said to me before they closed her up. They even tucked her bike in there, not one bent spoke on either tire. But I was shape shaking and sobbing too hard to say goodbye. I imagine her telling her friends later, it hardly grazed me, but this lady who saw it went crazy. I did. I was molecular. While even the driver who hit her did little more than roll his eyes, while he wolfed down, a trucker stuck at the intersection, wolfing down a sandwich behind the wheel, sighed. Someone touched me on the shoulder and asked, are you all right? Over in 10 seconds, she stood, all blonde, shook her wings like a little cough. Are you okay? Someone else asked me, uneasily, as if overhearing my heartbeat and embarrassed for me that I was made of such gushing meat in the middle of the day on a quiet street. They should have put her in the ambulance, not me. Laughter, shit happens, to be young, to shrug it off. But ah, sweet thing, take pity. One day you too may be an accumulation of regrets, catastrophes, a clay animation of Psalm 73. But as for me, my feet, no, it will be Psalm 48. They saw it and so they marveled. They were troubled and hasted away. Today, you don't remember the way you called my name so desperately a thousand times, tearing your hair and your clothes on the floor and the nurse who denied your morphine so that you had to die that morning under a single sheet without me in agony, but this time I was beside you. I waited and I saved you. I was there. So <clears throat> we um, have chickens and hens and a rooster, and our rooster's name is Ivan. And this is about him. He's um, full of sort of vain glory. He just really thinks he's got it all under control. <laughs> he's a. Uh, He's a believer in his own 
powers. And so this is about him. It's called Ivan. Our rooster's name is Ivan. He rules the world. He stands on a bucket to assist the sun in its path through the sky. He will not be attending the funeral. For God has said to Ivan, you will never be sick or senile. I'll kill you with lightning or let you drown. Or I'll simply send an eagle down to fetch you when you're done. So Ivan stands on a bucket and looks around. Human stupidity, the pitiful cornflakes in their bowls, the statues of their fascists, the insane division of their cells, the misinterpretations of their Bibles, their homely combs, and today, absurdly, their crisp black clothes. But Ivan keeps his thoughts to himself and crows. This is called The Accident. The creator who dashed off a bird, who snapped his fingers over the waters and holy shit, what is it? A fish, he said, a lot like a bird, except it swims. He's so talented, the other gods said of him, but that wasn't it. Like the coffee of my subconscious spilled all over my wedding dress, look, looking down from such a distance. What the poem must have looked like on the page to the student assigned to read it who could not read, and the way it took me all semester to understand what he was faking, because the others who seemed to read seemed also not to understand. Still, I should have guessed, not understanding made them angry, while he kept raising his hand to give me better, stranger answers to my questions. Consider daffodils, consider cancer, Consider certain tiny lizards, and that long before anyone could count, there was still math. And this poem I, is called, this is not a poem, uh, slash fairy tale. And uh, so it's, ba it's based on something I read uh, in um, the newspaper in Michigan. Uh, and um, so I wrote this. Sixteen years ago in northern Michigan, somewhere in the Huron National Forest, a man and a woman from a nearby town pulled over to the shoulder of the road, took their two-year-old son asleep out of the back seat, walked with him into the woods a mile or so, and set him down. It was still light enough for them to find their way back to their car. God help us, they went home. These people, Drugs were involved, we must suppose. Some kind of profound stupidity made greater with desperation. Although it isn't possible to have sympathy for them, one still searches for some explanation. Did they sleep that night? Were they startled when the phone by the bedside rang? Well, they confessed the whole thing the next day after the child was found walking, toddling, the finder called it, along that shoulder of the road. A policeman recognized him from his own child's daycare center, and he was a smart little guy. He knew his name. This much was in the paper. Everything else you have to imagine for yourself in order to survive, as he did. In order to survive it, you have to imagine it every day, when you lie down to go to sleep and when you wake. But in between, in between, your mind is full of trees. And it's quite dark, despite the moon. But this summer's been a warm one. And someone tied your tiny shoes for you. Um, I'm going to read a few new poems before I end. Um, <clears throat> um, and this one is, and maybe, you know, if some of you are sticking around afterward and you know something about gold that you could tell me to explain to me why it's so precious. I mean, I know that it is, and I, you know, I keep trying to, no one will talk to me about this. Everybody's just like, everyone knows it's precious, you know, it's this incredible thing thing but you can't eat it I mean I know that paper money is not you know you can't eat that either but at least I understand the symbolism of that but gold it's like you know it's not just symbolism people really covet gold so I was you know I just can never get it nobody wants to talk about this they can see how stupid it is not to understand <laughs> it's gold okay it just is um, and so anyways, thinking about that, and then also, uh, and, you know, my skepticism about gold. But then also read a, uh, 
another, I read this fact about gold, and then I soon after read this fact about frozen embryos. Um, and uh, there are, it's in the poem, but there are 400,000 frozen embryos now uh, in the world, mostly in this country, of course. And uh, that, to me, that seems weird to me, all those potential souls. But gold, I don't know. So uh, this is called Poem Ending with a Fact About Gold. I mean, if you're going to hoard something, I don't know. If all of it were melted down, they say, it would only fill two swimming pools. Olympic-sized, but still, that's all. The teeth, the wedding bands, the watches, take down the hall of mirrors and toss in the frames. Along with the death mask of Agamemnon and the single seashell earring given to me by my mother because I lost the other one long ago in the Gulf of Mexico. There, the fish pass over dreamily, though it might catch a fish's cold eye now and then with its gleaming, fish thinking, not worth eating. Even the Pope would have to drink the blood of Christ from a plastic cup by then. Of course, the gulls would never notice that the new world was without gold, nor would the world's 400,000 frozen embryos. But from those, a music, like 800,000 fingers circling the golden rims of 800,000 half-filled champagne glasses rises very cold, as if a potential army of future ghosts, no souls, had slipped into a poem ending without a fact about gold. This is called What I Learned in Ninth Grade. I'm going to read this poem and uh, uh, two, two more. One short and one just a little bit longer. Um, so I say this is called What I Learned in Ninth Grade. And it would not be a very inspirational poster like the, you know, everything I know I learned in kindergarten. This one is not going to, you know, this one is not going to be on your bulletin board. <laughs> so it's, but I did learn it, and it was ninth grade. What I learned in ninth grade. Always it's early winter, and you can always see through the Venetian blinds that you are floating and lost in a classroom made of mist, and that the false flattery of certain groups of girls is a feast of pure sugar that you must eat with your eyes closed while you swallow down its spoonfuls along with your flatterer's smiles. And you'll do it. Tropism equals a natural inclination. The roots grow down, the bird flies up. In some future, my husband will run toward the accident to see if he can help, while I'll stand frozen on the sidewalk, hiding my hot eyes behind my hands. But that was just biology, and Mrs. Anders liked me. Elsewhere, there's a number that is not the phone number of a friend, but which I'm told I have to memorize. For without this number, the whole civilization will have to end, and I might never go on to 10th grade, rem remaining forever in ninth. God, how hard Mr. Nestor was trying in his raging kindness and shiny ties to teach us what it meant to designate the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter and to call it pi. But this was dummy math. Some of us were sleeping. Some of us were high. Some of us were so desperate and confused that we were weeping. Surely he wasn't serious. We would never flunk or die. Surely one day a cure could be found for the kind of cancer my mother had, and then there would no longer be this need for math. Surely some researcher at some place like Yale, a place to which I've been assured I will never go, will discover this. And even if a cure for math cannot be found, can math not simply be destroyed? This is the greatest country in the world. Why must its children suffer under pie? Cannot a scapegoat be slaughtered on an altar as in the Bible, or an entire civilization as in the past? May we not bomb it, invade it, steal its oil, or at least set its oil wells on fire? To my fellow soldiers, dummies, all of us, ruthless and proud of it, I said, we will spare their children if we can, of course, but only if they renounce their god of pie. Yes, in another year, I would learn of love from reading about Daisy and Jay. But in ninth grade, I learned about hatred, how to raise an army in my imagination, how to dress it in bright uniforms with hierarchical stripes, how to spray the peaceful valleys of my enemies with pesticides until it rained poisonous butterflies onto their flesh from the skies. And then, sweet Jesus, 
after it had already been memorized, to be told that 3.14159 is not quite pi, because pi is irrational and transcendent. So pi might just go on and on, or not go on, like ninth grade or civilization, which also began and ended in Babylon. The wall. One night from the other side of a motel wall made of nothing but sawdust and pink stuff, I listened as a man cried to someone on the telephone that all he wanted to do before he died was to come home. I want to come home. That night, a man cried until I was ankle deep in sleep and then up to my neck, wading like a swimmer or like a suicide through the waves of him crying and into the deep as icebergs cracked into halves as jellyfish like thoughts were passed secretly between people and the seaweed like the sinuous soft green hair of certain beauty queens washed up by the sea except that we were in utah and one of us was weeping while the other one was sleeping with nothing but a thin dry wall between us this is called two men in a truck and this will be my last poem. <clears throat> I, I hope it sort of brings things full circle since the, the first poem I read was about my son when he's a baby now. He's a grown man and he can move furniture for people. <laughs> so, um, two men in a truck. Do you have that around here? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so that was a Midwest thing. Okay, two men in a truck. Once I was as large as any living creature could be, I could lift the world and carry it from my breast to its bath. When I looked down from the sky, you could see the love in my eye. Oh, tiny world, if anything ever happened to you, I would die. And I said no to the hand, snatched the pebble from the mouth, fished it out, and told the world it would choke, warned the world over and over, do you hear me? Do you want to choke? But how is the world to know what the truth might be? Perhaps they grant you special powers, these choking stones. Maybe they change the child into a god, all swallowing. For clearly there were other gods. The world could see that I, too, was at the mercy of something. Sure, I could point to the sky and say its name, but I couldn't make it change. Some days it was blue, true, but others were ruined by its gray. I'm sorry, little world. No picnic, no parade, no swimming pool today and the skin knee in spite of me, and why else would there be such terror in the way she screamed, and the horn honking and the squealing wheels, and afterward her cold sweat against my cheek? Ah, she wants us to live forever. It's her weakness, now I see. But once I was larger than any other being, larger, perhaps, than any being had any right to be, because, of course, eventually the world grew larger and larger until it could lift me up and put me down anywhere it pleased. Until, finally, I would need its help to move the bird bath, the bookshelf, the filing cabinet. And could you put my desk by the window, sweetie? A truck, two men, one of them my son, and everything I ever owned, and they didn't even want to stop for lunch. Even the freezer, even the piano. You can have it if you can move it. But once, I swear, I was. And now, this trunk in the attic to prove it. These shoes in the palm of my hand? You used to wear them on your feet. This blanket the size of a hand towel? I used to wrap it around you sleeping in my arms like this. See? This is how small the world used to be when everything else in the world was me. Thank you very much.